Ladies and gentlemen, I am Xiao Kai Zhang, and today I will be moderating for Professor Jörg Laustam for this very wonderful lecture that I am personally very much looking forward to. Uh, I will be speaking in both Mandarin and English, but for the most part, I'll be speaking in English. At the end of the session, I will do a little paraphrase of his presentation in Mandarin. But aside from that, most of it, uh, most of my part will be done in English. Um, I am Xiao Kai as we said. Uh, I am research professor at Zhejiang University, and I uh, I was uh, a visiting scholar at ISCS back in 2017, where I finished my uh, monograph on Augustine and Karl Barth, and. Uh, since then, I've been working closely with ISCS, including um, serving as a member of the editorial committee for Logos and Pneuma or Daofeng. Now, and uh, uh, I am not the main character today. Our hero today is Professor Jörg Lauster, of whom I uh, am a big fan, uh, or I have been a very big fan. I first came across his work back in 2015, I believe, uh, when I was uh, writing a essay for a, uh, an Oxford handbook on 19th century Christian thought. And that was when I came across a, a, a work of his titled, uh, I think I remember the title actually, uh, uh, Principle and the Method is the English translation. And I think the subtitle is um, the transformation of Protestant uh, textual principles from Schleiermacher to the present. Now that work was uh, written in German, published uh, by the great Moor Siebeck. And uh, I, I believe that this work was uh, Professor Lausdorff's uh, Habi or uh, Habilitation Script. And currently, Professor Lauster is serving as Professor of Systematics or Dogmatics and Philosophy of Religion and Ecumenics at the University of Munich, or otherwise known as Ludwig Maximilian Universität München. He has many, many publications, including How to Do Transcendence with Words. One of his most recent trans, uh, uh, publications is one on uh, the Holy Spirit or a biography on the Holy Spirit. Uh, just the title is very interesting to me. He has also worked with my friend Tobias Tan uh, from Oxford uh, in a volume on the studies in theology and religion. And today he will be talking to us about religious experience. Um, the, the topic is going to range from Kant to Schleiermacher to Hegel and to uh, our situation today in a global context. And I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. So we are gonna um, have him uh, do the lecture for about an hour and then I will do a response. I'll, I'll first begin with a paraphrase in Mandarin and then uh, do a little response and raise a question of my own to the speaker. And then um, you will be able to uh, raise questions for him. You are welcome to, to raise your questions in either Chinese or English, or if you know German, feel free to write in German. Um, I, I can translate that for you into Mandarin or English for the audience. Uh, and you will see on your screen, on your Zoom screen, uh, this uh, little button that you can press that says Q&A. Just press that button, then you can raise your questions. And uh, also, I believe that Professor Lausta has made his syllabus for the lecture available uh, in 
in word format, which I think you can find in our Q and A section. But I'm I'm not sure if that's been cancelled because um, he made a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but you, you can look into that link and try to see if you can find uh, the the file for the syllabus for today's lecture. So without further ado, let me hand the time over to Professor Lausta. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just check here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thanks for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, yeah, thank you uh, to ICS for the invitation. And uh, as I said, thank you very much for uh, the very, very kind uh, introduction. Yeah, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you and to discuss with you a topic of uh, um, religious experience. Unfortunately, my Mandarin is very, very bad. Uh, I can say I hope ni hao, uh, but uh, not so much more. Uh, Chinese is a very difficult language for us. Um, so I apologize for speaking uh, in English. So now I try to uh, share the screen with you for... Uh, yeah. Um, so my uh, topic of today, um, of, our, of our presentation is um, what is religious experience, a historical overview from Kant to the present. If someone wants to talk about religious experience, uh, he first has uh, to give an explanation why religious experience, because that is not the main topic uh, in the studies of religion or in philosophy uh, of religion. So uh, there is first a methodological argument. And uh, this argument uh, I want to uh, develop now a little bit further. So uh, in religious studies for a long time, a detailed empirical description of religious customs, rites, and practices has dominated the research projects. Or in the subject I teach at my university in Germany, uh, Munich, at Munich uh, is philosophy of religion. Even there, normally we do not deal with religious experience. Normally we deal in philosophy of religion with arguments to defend or to decline transcendence. Uh, and we are more or less working like in history of ideas. And there is a third uh, topic, uh, sociologists, um, for example, and we will come back uh, to him later, like Max Weber, are also interested in religion, but not so much in religious experience. Uh, they are looking for the practices and their influences uh, to society. So back again, uh, I have to um, give uh, an apology if I am interested in religious experience, because experience is quite a delicate category. The category of religious experience was mainly introduced by prominent scholars of the 19th century. In our German tradition, Friedrich Schleiermacher, Ernst Drölsch, Rudolf Otto, but there is also a strong Anglophone tradition. Just Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and of course, finally, one of the major authors uh, William James. They all invented different descriptions. One of them we will uh, see in the next hour, but they agreed basically in one point. And that's here the text you can find. Whoever wants to understand religion must go back to the religious experience of human subjects, to their articulations and self-expressions of these experiences. For the study of religion, this is until today the most important methodological argument. We do not learn more about religion if we look at it with a so-called scientific objectivism, which wants to talk only over religion. We learn more about religion if we analyze the inward perspective. That is the main point uh, why we deal with religious experience it is the inward experience, uh, the inward perspective. All participants of various religious 
religions, uh, what um, underline these invert perspective, and this is uh, the interesting point for us. So first, there is a methodological reason um, why we should deal with experience. Second is a scientific reason, I would call it that way. That's the so-called emotional turn uh, in the sciences, um, in humanities in, let me say, the last 20 years. I can give you a very, uh, very small example uh, of daily life. In the last 10 years, the German weather forecast has introduced an interesting new category. If you see our in television news, then at the end there is a weather forecast. Um, and in addition to the forecast temperature, uh, weather reports have added in the last 10 years, as I said, a new category, the so called perceived temperature. That would be the German translation. In English, uh, that is called wind chill. Uh, in that case, I will find, I, I think the German expression is better for my interest because it's, it's really, it's actually called perceived temperature. For an example, during the last winter in Germany, here at the south of Germany, Munich, uh, quite close to the mountains, let me say in the coldest days, we had a, quite a mild winter, in the coldest days we had eight or 10 degrees under zero. And you can read two temperatures uh, in the weather forecast let me say eight degree under zero, uh, and then 12 or even 15 degrees, the second uh, temperature as perceived temperature. The wind makes us feel the temperature in a different way. The German distinction, however, gives us the impression that there are two temperatures, the objective physical measure temperature and the subjective temperature. That is interested. Let me say 10 degree Celsius under zero can have various uh, effects uh, to human beings. So the subjective category is quite important. And that is um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this very simple example, what I wanted to show is that there is not only an objective um, encounter with uh, reality, there is also a subjective encounter with reality and there are emotions and feelings are very important. So we are in the middle of the huge debate on emotions and uh, reality. What can we learn from reality by emotions? And that is the point, the second point why we should uh, be interested or why it could be helpful to be interested in the category of religious experience. My second point is Immanuel Kant. He is probably the greatest or at least one of the greatest philosophers uh, which who, whom we ever had in Germany and Kant is famous uh, as a very very uh, strong uh, thinker. Uh, a very, very strong thinker uh, means he is arguing, he is uh, putting the arguments on logic and uh, um, is a very rational author. But even in Kant, we can find uh, uh, um, something very interesting, and that is uh, the quote you can find here. Uh, it is very famous, a very famous, one of the famous uh, uh, quotations of uh, Immanuel Kant. It's at the end of his so-called second critique, uh, uh, the critique of practical reason, and it's uh, actually at one of the last pages of the book. So if you uh, want to follow it, uh, so I, I have not given any closer um, quotations, you can find it easily. It's at the end of the so-called second critique. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the more often and steadily we reflect upon them. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. I do not seek or conjecture either of them as if they were real obscurities or extravagances beyond the horizon of my vision. 
I see them before me and connect them immediately with the consciousness of my experience. That is the main point. Oh, there are two <laughs> main points. First, we have this strong, some would say a little bit cold, uh, or at least cool philosopher uh, who is never talking such much about emotions. And at the end uh, of one of his most famous uh, books, he is admiring the stars in the heaven and the moral law uh, within him. And the last sentence of our quotation is interest interesting. I see them before me and connect them immediately. That is the point uh, we will see, um, which becomes very interesting in a theory of relig religious experience immediately with the consciousness of my existence. So even in the strong and quite cool philosopher Immanuel Kant, we have a hint of an immediate encounter with uh, his consciousness, and that would uh, help us to understand a little bit more what is a religious experience. I will not go so far to say that Kant is here in, in, in that phrase describing something like a religious experience that would be um, probably an over interpretation but i would go so sorry okay. apologize uh, i would go so far uh, to say that um emmanuel kant uh, is describing here something like an inner attitude and inner contact to reality, which is quite close uh, to um, that what we later will call a religious experience. There is, uh, by the way, an interesting link. Um, as far as we know, I'm, we have no proof of that, but um, Kant was quite a Puritan uh, uh, type, uh, but he had one uh, picture in his writing room and uh, uh, that is um, um, is a picture of uh, Immanuel. Um, no, in the writing of Immanuel Kant was one picture, and it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the great French philosopher. And so um, we um, mm, there is a long discussion whether uh, Kant was an admirer of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, what is for us here interesting, we find uh, in Jean-Jacques Rousseau a lot of interesting points uh, where Rousseau is uh, discussing um, this inner perspective, this immediate encounter with reality, and probably that could be uh, a link. So if sometimes at uh, one time I, I would like to write a history of religious experience, I have to bring both authors, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the great French philosopher, and Immanuel Kant. So let us come to uh, the more detailed uh, um, explanation of that what is religious experience, uh, the modern foundation of religious experience, uh, and there is one of the most important uh, um, excesses uh, is done by uh, romanticism. The left side you might have seen before, the famous picture of uh, um, the German painter Caspar David Friedrich, um, which is purely a romantic painting. On the right side, uh, um, you see Charles Taylor, uh, the famous Canadian philosopher. So now my uh, uh, task is to uh, explain what Charles Taylor on the right side uh, still alive quite in his, um, I, I, I think he's over 90, but uh, uh, still alive, still still writing. Uh, and the left side, uh, um, you see a romantic painting. So what has Charles Taylor to do with romanticism? Um, the category of religious experience does not only bring a methodological advantage, as I said, it follows a deep conviction. And that is my theory, a deep conviction of modernity. We cannot conceive the world in another mode than in the invert and subjective perspective of human beings. Personal experience is the window to the world. That's the point. 
to enlighten the internal process and its expressions with rational arguments is the other side of the research of religious experience. And, you know, it comes to Charles Taylor in his famous book, Sources of the Self. He has named two main sources of modern uh, identity. One is uh, Romanticism and the other Enlightenment. Both come together in the scientific contemplation of religious experience. So the personal experience that is a deep uh, um, conviction of at least Western modern identity that all what can all experiences are personal uh, experiences, inward experiences. That is our window uh, to the world, and that's why uh, uh, romanticism is not a cliche uh, on. Uh, persons who prefer uh, moons in the night or starry heavens uh, or candlelight dinners. Uh, romanticism is a deep modern attitude to encounter reality. As we know, uh, romanticism has a deep influence uh, uh, on German uh, theology, and that is here um, Friedrich Schleiermacher. Friedrich Schleiermacher uh, was called uh, in a lot of manuals um, of German theology, a church father of German and um, global Protestantism of the 19th century. Uh, we can uh, actually call him that way because uh, he is an important uh, figure and he is for all concepts of religious experience, um, um, yeah, probably uh, the main figure. Schleiermacher, uh, lived in a variety of society, uh, cities, but mainly at Berlin uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, he was a dean of the uh, um, faculty, Protest uh, faculty for Protestant uh, theology at the main same time when Hegel uh, was uh, dean or at least professor of the faculty um, for philosophy. So you can see uh, at which time or less he lived he um, knew personally Fichte, um, there are some contacts to Schelling, so Schleiermacher is, as a Protestant theology, in the inner circle of the uh, intellectual debates of German idealism. So, uh, and uh, that is interesting, the early Romanticism, uh, especially the thoughts of uh, Fichte, are very influential on um, the Romanticism. Schleiermacher is famous for two books, and he has had written much more, but for two books he is quite famous. Uh, the first uh, is a book uh, he had written as quite a young man, um, Speeches on Religion. It is written in 799, um, and this is uh, a, a pure uh, romantic theory of religion. And then he has written a second book, Religion as, uh, that is a Christian face, that is his main work. Uh, the um, older Schleiermacher uh, has written that religion as sensibility and taste for the infinite is one of the uh, main phrases. This phrase is from the speeches. Um, religion is sensibility and taste for the universe. That's quite a new uh, definition, and we will see uh, soon that, for example, his colleague at Berlin University, Hegel, um, could not agree uh, with him. So he completely disagreed with that theory uh, of religion. But to that, we will come later. So what should that mean? Uh, that is always uh, um, something we could critique um, or a certain type of critic on Romanticism that they have always nice words, but it is hard to understand what they are really dealing with. So let us have a look at the famous um, uh, paragraph three of his main work, uh, Christian Face. There we find ba uh, uh, Schleiermacher's basic definition of religion. And that is uh, the quotation you can find uh, on the slide. The piety, which forms the basis of all ecclesiastical communions, is considered purely in itself neither a knowing nor 
a doing, but a modification of feeling or of immediate self-consciousness. That is a, a very famous uh, um, interpretation uh, of religion. Religion is not knowing. So that would be for my subject, for example, very interesting uh, for a phil philosophy of religion. Schleiermacher would argue um, there, is, there are no new knowledges which we can grasp with uh, through religion. Uh, on the other hand, he also neglects uh, identification of religion and doing. That means uh, religion is not ethics, it's not moral philosophy. Um, so there is a third thing. It's evident uh, what Schleiermacher tries uh, to do here. It is uh, to underline the independence of religious experience to other actions of our consciousness. And he would go so far to say there are three main areas in our consciousness, knowing, doing, and uh, that third point, feeling. And that's not enough, not feeling as it own is a, a, religious, a religious experience. There is a certain modification. There, are, um, there is a long discussion what means uh, modification um, to make these very long discussions short. Uh, we could translate Schleiermacher, uh, the word modification, we could say there is a determination of feeling. And that leads us finally to immediate self-consciousness. Uh, that is uh, a main point. But if you do not understand what means immediate self-consciousness, uh, don't worry about that. There is a long discussion. It is hard to understand, even for scholars and philosophy of religion, what Schleiermacher want to say. What should that be? Immediate uh, self-consciousness. But what uh, you now can see, that's the second time in a very, very famous phrase, uh, we can find the word immediate. We find it, uh, I can go back here, we find it in, uh, in uh, Kant at the end, immediately with the consciousness of my experience, and then we can find it here in Schleiermacher, uh, or immediate self-consciousness. So what should that be? Um, Schleiermacher uh, tried to explain that in a lot of uh, other uh, uh, discussions. Um, for example, there is a, a very um, famous quotation. He says, the immediate presence of the whole undivided uh, being uh, and all that. Um, Schleiermacher uh, so, uh, uh, himself gives us uh, uh, an example. Schleiermacher attempts to explain this complex difference by uh, way of a few examples and quotation thus, joy and sorrow. Schleiermacher is writing, those mental phases, which are always so important in the rearm of religion, are genuine states of feelings in the proper sense explained above. In his book, whereas self-approval and self-reproach belongs himself rather to the uh, objective consciousness. These examples give us a way to understand the distinction between the consciousness of states of feelings and the objective consciousness that would be type of knowing. The latter, uh, the, the objective consciousness is always mediated by a kind of reflection. Whereas the former is an activity of consciousness as pure, and now that's the point, receptivity. I could say, but it is a dangerous word, I could say passivity. Um, we are only perceiving in that what uh, Schleiermacher wants to show us with religion. The feeling of joy, for example, demonstrates this evidently. Joy is not produced by an act of reflection or of will. It is just the awareness of an inner state. I cannot produce uh, these um, states. Uh, and that is the point that religious, and um, we will come back to that later, religious experience is nothing uh, what we can produce. That has to do, of course, with uh, modern critique uh, of religious experience. Uh, we 
will be that very soon. So in that uh, distinction, famous distinction of Schleiermacher, first there is a religious experience as an inward perspective, uh, as a very immediate encounter to reality. And uh, secondly, there are all the expressions of religion. That is, as Schleiermacher would say, um, a deep misunderstanding of Western uh, theology that dogmatic expressions are not the first thing. Dogmatic expressions are the second thing. First is uh, the modification of a feeling or determination of a feeling, an inward perspective. And secondly, uh, we try to understand that and then we build theories, doctrines, uh, rights, uh, and all that. But the first thing is the inward perspective. So uh, we have here in uh, uh, Schleiermacher a very uh, deep um, theory of religious experience, um, which is uh, very famous uh, in the tradition of uh, uh, religious experience, um, arguing first a feeling, secondly, uh, there will be um, an act of interpretation uh, like doctrines and uh, things like that. In the 19th century, uh, we have a long uh, um, discussion on that and we have strong critique of uh, religious experience. And uh, as you may see, I would mention all that uh, just very uh, briefly. Um, We, you, has a, a list of very famous uh, uh, philosophers or um, let me say thinkers um, and with Karl Barth, um, the, um, you can find him right in the right side down, uh, bottom of the right side down. Uh, uh, we also find that that is quite interesting uh, uh, theological critique. And my moderator, Professor Zhang, who is an expert on uh, Karl Barth, would, could explain that um, much better than me. But you have here four uh, um, figures, main figures of our tradition, who share one thing. They are all strongly against uh, the category of religious experience. Have a, uh, let us have just a, quite a brief, quick look uh, on the main arguments. Hegel, uh, there is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was a colleague of Schleiermacher. They both uh, knew each other personally. Uh, Berlin was at the beginning of the 19th century, not such a huge city as it is today. Uh, and there is in a comment or a letter uh, to a friend, he's writing on Schleiermacher's uh, books and uh, uh, he's saying, who appeals to his feeling betrays humanity. Uh, that is a very hard uh, sentence and uh, it sounds very, very harsh, but um, the argument is um, Hegel, what, what Hegel wants to say is that if we appeal to our feelings, we um, only base or only argue with subjective arguments and that is betraying humanity because uh, we leave the commonplace of arguments. You can, it is easy to give an example of personal life if in a, in a fight between two persons, uh, one person is saying, uh, I feel that, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then arguing uh, is, uh, has, coming, has come to an end. Uh, you can not uh, argue against uh, uh, feeling. Um, and that was uh, the deep critique of Hegel uh, that subjectivity is uh, a type of intellectual isolation, uh, a self-elected isolation, um, but uh, it is denying to argue. 
that is a very strong uh, critique. So, and uh, I will show you in the, at the end of my paper that, uh, uh, of course, we have to face this critique. We have to face all these four types of critique. The second is, uh, and of course, more famous. That's a strong Western uh, tradition of uh, the critique of religion in general. Uh, it starts with Feuerbach, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. These are uh, the four uh, main figures of the critique of modern critique of uh, religion. They all have in common one point. Religion is an illusion. It would be interesting to, to show how they uh, are close to, to Hegel. Uh, in the case of Feuerbach and Barth, we can show that easily that are, there are links uh, to um, Hegel and Feuerbach. Uh, religion is an uh, illusion means what we, we produce something in ourselves. Feuerbach is saying, uh, uh, religion is a projection uh, of our consciousness. Uh, Marx is saying it's a projection. Um, it's so called opium for the people. Uh, it is to because um, um, we can, uh, it helps us to overcome the sadness of our life. Uh, opium means a type of drug. It is not, it is a person who is not brave enough to face reality, uh, he um, <clears throat> goes to religion uh, as a type of medicine against the hard reality. And that we have uh, in Nietzsche, uh, religion is weakness. And we have that in Freud, religion is uh, illusion. Uh, we could make it more um, precise. Freud's critique is saying it is an infantile uh, illusion. It is. Mm, Religious persons are in a certain way um, at the um, level of children um, in their uh, intellectual development. Now, these points are from Marx to Freud is a, is a harsh critique uh, overall over a religious experience, saying that there is nothing uh, uh, which corresponds to religious experience. Charles Darwin uh, is a third uh, point, and uh, uh, he is, as far as I would say, very interesting. Um, I tried to do it a couple of years ago uh, in a paper to, to uh, discuss uh, the attitude of Darwin to religion, which I found uh, very interesting. Uh, as you may know, uh, Darwin started at Cambridge University in UK and in England, uh, starting theology. He wanted to become a, a pastor uh, in the countryside of a small English parish, and then uh, his travel around the world with the Beagle changed his life plans completely. But uh, he was familiar with uh, the Anglicanism, with uh, tradition of English Christianity. And uh, uh, even later, he is not a fierce uh, critic uh, of religion, which we found uh, in Darwin. There are some remarks uh, which I would describe it more a type of sadness. No, sadness is too hard, Mel melancholy. Uh, the argument of Darwin is now regarding religion is if we, and that was his, of course, uh, we know that all his main uh, um, um, book is on, or his main research projects are on evolution. And Darwin says, and we have in his autobiography, which is <laughs> simply called My Life, uh, we find these traces, very in interesting remarks. Um, he says, first, when I was a young man, I believed that all the beautiness uh, of the world uh, leads us uh, to the assumption of a divine creator of all these. There must be an in, something like a, an intelligent design of the world, and uh, God is the last cause for the beautiness of the world. 
But then studying and studying nature, I couldn't find uh, uh, this order, uh, this secret order of the world. And we can put it very simple. The law of evolution is chance. There is no aim where uh, evolution is going to. And uh, there is, and that is now the speciality of Darwin, there is no uh, deeper meaning in the reality. There is no deeper meaning that we can find. And finally, there is no transcendent dimension of the world. Um, that is, uh, uh, I would find uh, quite an interesting uh, um, aspect that religious experience is not as far as hard as Marx and Freud would say, it is a false uh, intuition. Um, Darwin wouldn't go so far. He is more cautious. He said, there is no uh, transcendence uh, which um, influences uh, our life. And so religious experience uh, is experience without any answer. There is no resonance uh, in the reality to that. Just a very, very small remark here. Um, uh, we have here at Munich at LM University um, a very famous for German relations, uh, famous professor in Chinese studies. And he has written, uh, I, I, I wanted to show, but I do not have it here. Uh, um, it was published one month ago, a book on one of many books of Chinese philosophy. And uh, we would like to, to, to do a seminary in next semester together. And um, I unfortunately, until now, I'm not an expert uh, in Chinese philosophy. That's the point is that I cannot read the sources in Chinese, so I have to read it in English or German. And uh, so please be very careful with my words, or I should be careful to saying that. But he's, uh, you know, in some discussions, I learned from him, and even that what I could read uh, on the dialogues of Confucius, uh, Confucius, I hope I pronounce it Confucius, is that uh, Confucius is a type, um, Confucianism uh, is an interesting attitude towards the world uh, without transcendence. And uh, that would be for an intercultural dialogue, um, very interesting um, how that works uh, to, to, have an, um, uh, to have an attitude towards the world without uh, transcendence. And though it would be interesting for, for a discussion between I don't know, German and uh, Chinese scholars, uh, is that, is he denying uh, transcendence or, and if I understood my colleague rightly, uh, he wouldn't deny transcendence. He only would say there is no influence uh, of transcendence uh, to our human life, uh, to our rights, to our moral uh, um, to the moral aspects of our life. So that would be quite uh, interesting. Uh, is there something like religious experience uh, in the Confucian tradition? But that is only a small remark and unfortunately I'm not an expert on that. What is interesting that my own tradition, uh, the theological uh, tradition mm, had uh, pronounced a very, very uh, um, hard critique on religious uh, experience. We could uh, um, call it uh, almost um, uh, an attack. Um, uh, Bart and uh, uh, Bultmann, I, I mentioned on the syllabus, but uh, it's, it's more, it's Bart, uh, um, said that uh, Kleiermacher's religious feeling denotes only the realization of human desires, a kind of pure aestheticism which leaves religion in, and that is now the critique in all, um, uh, leaves in irrationalism. And uh, there is a famous uh, phrase by uh, Bart, it's in semi-darkness. So um, that is, he's going back to the critique, which we can find just in Hegel. Um, that is pure subjectivism, uh, a type of, we could uh, also call it sentimentalism, um, which produces um, the dealing with religious experience. 
So uh, as far we can, we, it is interesting that uh, in the ninth or beginning of the, the 20th century, uh, there are strong, very strong voices against religious experience. And so uh, it is for us uh, very interesting to see that uh, religious experience nevertheless uh, had a great resurrection at the end of 19th century. And there are a, a couple of scholars um, who went back to the idea of religious experience. And uh, so I'm at my fifth point, the modern defense of religious experience. Just to make uh, clear uh, the, um, what I wanted to say is we had first in the surroundings of romanticism, uh, we had uh, um, the invention, let me say that way of religious experience as a known category. Then we had a strong critique in the 19th century. And then in the third point, we had an apology of religious experience um, going back to the arguments of romanticism. So uh, it is impossible to speak about religious experience without uh, um, mentioning William James, the great American scholar who wrote the book um, um, with the title of religious experience. As so um, this is the most famous book on that. Um, it is called Varieties of Religious Experience, um, one of the most uh, important uh, books um, regarding uh, the phenomenon of religious experience. There we find uh, uh, it's quite at the beginning. Uh, I, I didn't uh, quote the pages because there are so much editions of this book. Uh, um, you will find it quite at the beginning. So religion, uh, and there comes um, the famous um, quotation, shall mean for us the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. That is uh, an excellent uh, uh, quotation. Um, I try to explain it a little bit more precisely. Um, as all kinds of experience, also uh, religious experience consists in personal engagement and involvement. That would be um, just the observation of Schleiermacher. It happens and cannot be produced, what we had called receptivity or passivity. And it sets free a special meaning of that what happens. Exactly here we find the differentia specifica, the spe special of the religious experience is the manner of a, we could call it that way, breaking through experience. The frame of the daily life is to be transcended to a higher dimension. The special of the religious experience is not to the intensity and not the objects of the experience. The special of the religious experience is a reference to the dimensions of transcendence. It is fascinating to see how careful and prudent uh, William James handles this category of transcendence. Analyzing the self-expressions of religious experience, they do not claim immediately an ontological or metaphysical proof for the transcendence. That is what we can find here in the quotation of William James. He says, they, the persons who made religious experience, um, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. I, William James, do not say that there is something like a divine. I can only observe that persons uh, who go back to religious experiences say that that what happens to them is caused by something uh, that we could call the divine. That is very cautious and methodologically in a, in a, in a very um, 
um, honest way. He says, if we go back to religious experience, we cannot, like the, the medieval tradition of uh, proof of gods, that we cannot do with religious experience. We can only say uh, that uh, there are persons who say that that happened uh, in themselves and they apprehend themselves to stand in relation with whatever they may consider the divine. Uh, so to make it very simple, James is saying, uh, not me as a scholar, uh, I can only observe that they, uh, the religious persons, do say that they are in contact with the divine. And that is a very interesting point. We can, uh, in a methodological way, uh, not prove the divine, but we can uh, observe uh, the contact uh, between uh, uh, to the divine by persons with religious experience or that they intend to have uh, contact. That is a uh, very, um, um, I would say it's cautious and honest uh, to argue that way. But on the other hand, it's a rebirth uh, of the figure of religious experience uh, because James is saying uh, it, 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 it would be too less uh, to describe uh, only from an external view. Uh, religious are doing that and then they do that and the moral views are that and then and that. Uh, we have to go back to that, what they say, what happens uh, inside uh, in, in the inward perspective. Max Weber, the so second one, uh, is um, uh, was a great scholar on religious studies. Um, you may uh, know that um, he did it in a quite different way than uh, William James. As a sociologist, uh, he was interested in the influence and the uh, um, um, reciprocal influences of religion to social systems. Uh, to economic uh, disciplines. Uh, he wrote a lot about uh, um, China. He was interested uh, very much in Chinese uh, culture under the perspective of an European of the 19th century. Um, so I guess that we have to rewrite uh, Weber's uh, remarks on China. We have to, to change a lot of that, but uh, at least he was interested uh, in it was not such an Eurocentric perspective as we have in other, scholars, in, in other scholars at that time. The point is that uh, Weber uh, is helpful for us. Weber, for example, it does not use the category of religious experience. So if there are some Weber experts among uh, you, you, you would wonder why I quote or why I mention here Weber. Um, Weber was a very rational person and a rational, typical German professor who does not deal, uh, uh, didn't want to deal with uh, something uh, subjective like religious experience. But uh, interesting is his theory of values. Uh, and uh, that was fascinating in Weber that he says, values are important, values are inner attitudes which are um, dominating our whole life. Uh, that's not strong thoughts uh, of philosophy or the inner, the inward perspective and values. <coughs> and that is the point uh, to go back to my first chapter, what we can learn from the so-called emotional turn. Mm, there are a lot of evaluative representations of reality inside us. That is where values are from. There are an evaluative representation. And that is what is important for us here. Uh, the evaluative representation is in the perception of reality, uh, we immediately evaluate um, reality. The one who brings these two aspects together is the German, the Protestant, the theologian and scholar of religious studies, Rudolf Otto. Um, he is, uh, I would say, after Schleiermacher, one of the most famous Protestant theologians dealing with the category of religious uh, experience. Uh, and um, as I have taught um, almost 10 years at Marburg University, though so I have to practice his type of uh, local patriotism, Marburg is a very small German city and it's, uh, it's just a university city, very kind city, had a strong influence in 1920, 
century. And Otto, like a lot of other famous scholars of the German tradition of the early 20th century, uh, taught uh, at Marburg. And when, when I uh, was uh, teaching at Marburg, I could go to the archive and, uh, and read and study his letters. And it was um, really this interesting figure uh, of Protestant theology in the early 20th century. His main work, uh, which is translated, I guess, in 20, more than 20 languages, uh, is the idea of the whole inquiry into non-rational factor and the idea of the divine and its relation to the rational. Um, and uh, there he is. Um, uh, it is, by the way, interesting that for some reasons uh, he is in the Anglophone tradition. Uh, he seems to be why uh, his Anglophone uh, reception seems to be wider uh, than in the German. In his work, Otto brings together very different uh, influences and not always uh, in a systematic order. So we might perhaps describe him almost as a kind of freak uh, thinker because he is putting together a lot of influences. Interesting for us is uh, how he tries to overcome the problem of subjectivism and realism in Schleiermacher. Um, he was a scholar studying a lot of Schleiermacher and following a famous expression of Schleiermacher's, um, let us call it higher realism. At the very beginning of his main work, the idea of the Holy Otto suggests replacing Schleiermacher's feeling of absolute uh, dependency with the concepts which he calls uh, creator feeling. He starts off by criticizing uh, Schleiermacher's um, position and uh, then he comes to his own point and that's a quotation you can find uh, on the slide. Rather, the creator feeling is itself a first subjective concomitant and effect of another feeling element which casts like a shadow but which in itself indubitably has immediate and primary reference to an object outside the self. Now, this object is just what we have already spoken of the nominus. So whether he calls it creator feeling all that, it's not, it's not the main point. The main point is religious experience is a reaction, is a reflex in the mind uh, it is, as Strölch, and Strölch, his colleague, said in a uh, um, book review, it is religious experience is the, re, the product of an impact. And that is where I come here together in Otto, James, and uh, Weber. He uh, said, with James, if we want to study religious experience, we have to describe. Uh, uh, religious experience. If we want to study religion, we have to describe inward perspectives. We have uh, to describe the subjectivity of religion. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can only talk uh, about over religion, but not what is a religion at itself. And secondly, these inward pers perspectives of religion, as James described, and as Weber mentioned, are evaluative representations. But, and that is where James and Weber were very cautious and saying, we do not know where they come from. We only can see that they exist in uh, sight, uh, the consciousness um, of religious persons. Otto is saying that is too less. We must ask, uh, go further, where do they come from? And that is what he says here in the last. It is the reference to an object outside itself. From the inward perspective, we can learn that this inward uh, perspective um, feels itself caused by something outside itself. That would be the, the main argument uh, against, um, uh, for example, the critique of religion is an illusion, because uh, at the moment of the religious experience, uh, Otto would say, oh, we make the experience that uh, the religious experience is caused by something uh, which is not the subject having this experience. Though that is a, 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 is a very famous uh, um, final point. Uh, um, so let me come uh, to my conclusion. 
we have seen here um, to Bella, he is in the uh, in the syllabus, uh, the last point of the, uh, I come back to him uh, very soon. I changed it. I put Bella uh, now to the conclusion. The way of uh, evaluative uh, representation, that would be um, the way from Schleiermacher to Rudolf Otto. Uh, so what are the consequences? Uh, for what it's helpful uh, to deal with religious experience? Um, so I would say we have some intercultural and interreligious uh, consequences. Um, the intercultural consequences uh, is that if we could open the study of religion to a broader, um, uh, in a broader sense that religion is not only doctrines and morals and certain rights, uh, if we could agree that religious experience is an encounter with reality, um, the um, borders between culture and religion are very fluid. Um, and uh, at least in our uh, in the history of Christianity in Europe, uh, we can observe that there are a lot of uh, um, um, cases where cultural aspects made uh, had a strong uh, impact, uh, more or stronger than doctrines. I will give you uh, only two quick examples. You may know that picture. Uh, that is from uh, Italian painter Giotto. It's a crucifix uh, in the church Santa Maria Novella in uh, Florence, uh, painted in the early 30th century. Uh, um, here you see on the left side, you see the whole picture and the right side, uh, you see Christ, uh, the body of Christ. Uh, the thing is uh, that we know from the sources that uh, this uh, uh, picture was a revolution. Uh, it caused um, among for our modern eyes, uh, uh, it's not so spectacular, but uh, for medieval eyes in Europe, they, they hadn't seen pictures, uh, they hadn't seen anything similar to that. And uh, this picture, we know that from the sources, from letters, from the reactions of the crowd, these uh, sources uh, created uh, religious experiences because uh, uh, the spectators of the picture on the right side, they um, could see for the first time uh, in the uh, European history, they could see for the first time uh, the uh, suffering of Christ. Uh, you can see them on the right side. So uh, painting, culture, art is a very uh, important uh, uh, source of religious experience. I could um, say much more about music, but that would be too difficult. Uh, we have famous composers like Bach uh, and Mozart in our tradition, which tries to produce religious experiences. And here is another famous, and it's, unfortunately, it's a very bad uh, picture, but it is um, uh, the Pietà of Michelangelo. Um, the same thing, uh, there between both are uh, 200 years, exact, almost exactly 200 years. Uh, this is at the beginning of the 16th century. And uh, what made Michelangelo so famous is his capacity as an artisan. Uh, the, the, the way producing his sculpture is at its world championship uh, at its best. But the point is he want, uh, wanted to also to, to express something like, uh, um, um, to express the experience of Christian humility. And that we can do uh, with cultural aspects of, uh, um, uh, with the cultural, with the possibilities of art, uh, probably, I wouldn't say better, but at least in a way, and it also can do a doctrine or a, a church teaching. So uh, I come finally to the, uh, inter-religious uh, consequences. And there it's a point where um, we have to discuss a very uh, delicate question and I do not want to discuss it. I only just want to mention it to, to, to open uh, um, the, the perspective. We have from Hegel on a series, are all religious equal question? Uh, or is there a hierarchy? Um, and to trans, um, form it to the question, to religious experience uh, is um, 
can we distinguish between the variety of religious experiences? Are they all the same, saying the same? No, that's not um, evident. Or are, are they uh, all linked together? And there Robert Bella uh, made in his unfortunately uh, last book, uh, late, um, um, it, he died, uh, I guess, 2013, and the book uh, um, was published one year earlier, uh, Hume, uh, Religion in Human Evolution. Um, he was very interested in, uh, he has a long, long chapter on Chinese um, philosophy also in his book. Uh, he uh, discussed the Indian religions uh, and uh, the Jewish religions. And at the end, he's asking, uh, what is what have they all uh, in common? And there we can find uh, um, in this great sum of a life work, Robert Bella's uh, last book, uh, the motto, nothing is ever lost. Uh, all these religious experiences are expressing um, attitudes or encounters uh, to the world. And what our task is, uh, in a um, common world to uh, discuss uh, these uh, possibilities of religious experiences. If we take the uh, concept serious, we could say uh, that um, religious experiences are experiences of the secret of our world and the secret uh, uh, of the world, of the whole world, not only of our life, uh, it's all, they all also deal with the secret of the world. And uh, therefore, I would say uh, it is a task for all human beings all over the world um, to discuss, um, to exchange our uh, opinions, um, what we can learn from religious experience. So thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much for such a fascinating lecture, Professor Lauster. Um, uh, I, uh, I paid total attention from the beginning to the end, and, uh, and the whole lecture has been just wonderful. Um, and please allow me just about uh, a few minutes to summarize your talk in Mandarin, and then I'll come back to you with um, two questions of my own, rather technical ones. And then we can perhaps open up the floor for the audience uh, for their contribution. Um, so allow me to switch to Mandarin. Um, now我们刚才这个老师教授给我们非常精彩的一个讲座啊，他从康德开始讲。他对康德的这个呈现我想非常的有趣因为在过去特别在国内讲到康德的时候会想到的是他是一个反形而上并且反神学的这么一个哲学家而虽然他那句名言就是老师教授在呈现康德的时候给我们看到那句第二批判的结
那这个呃，致那些呃藐视宗教的呃这个文化人这本护教著作里面提出说，宗教既不是理性的知识体系，它也不是道德的呃行为。宗教关乎去品尝那无限的宇宙，嗯，在乎去感受，或者是去经历那个无无限的宇宙。于是，在施莱马赫这里就开辟出一条，呃，十九世纪的形而上的浪漫主义的或观念论的这样子的，呃，宗教经验的路线，呃，这样子的。呃，路线在特洛尔奇等神学家，就是 a s t r o c h 他们这里，呃，达到了一个高峰。而在十九世纪，也出现了不少的思想家，不只是哲学家，也包括其他学科的这些思想家，不止在欧陆，在英伦也有。呃，从施莱马赫同时期的，在柏林的这个同事。黑格尔，黑格尔其实是赖马赫引进到柏林去的，后来两个人又不睦啊。我这故事我们今天不多讲。呃，包括黑格尔对施莱马赫的一个很重要的批评，虽然两个人都是德国观念论者，两个人都在论述神人之间的同一性，或者有限者、无限者之间的同一性，但是黑格尔认为感性的宗教。应该只是一个表象，要呈现哲学的理性本质。所以他认为，像施莱马赫那样子，把宇宙的本质视作我们用感性可以去经历的一个对象的时候，呃，他是背叛了人类。所以黑格尔对呃宗教经验的这样子的啊施莱马赫的路线提出了这样子的批评。另外，拉斯特教授也介绍了，在英伦方面有达尔文。呃，在，呃，在欧陆这边有瑞士神学家卡尔巴特等等，他们都对十九世纪以施莱尔马赫为首的这种宗教经验学说提出了呃不同意义上的批判。那当然还有马克思也提出了这样呃呃。呃这个批判就是我们在国内可能很熟悉的一句话，就宗教都是人民的鸦片。那当然，他在这里所指的鸦片还不一定就是呃，在我们的语境里面理解的那种毒品的鸦片，而更多的是一种麻醉剂，去减轻呃无产阶级人民群众的痛苦的这么一个逃避呃现实的一个东西。好，那再到后来有。像这个马克思韦伯 （Max Weber） 有呃 William James 美国的这个嗯叫做实用主义 （Pragmatist） 的哲学家，他们从不同的角度呃去论述宗教经验，给宗教经验的这个概念呃开辟了一个让我们在当代。更有跨文化、跨宗教对话空间的这样子的进入，呃，这基本上就是刚才呃劳斯特教授给我们呈现的宗教经验这个概念，在西方思想史上面的呃从康德一将的一系列的发展。So that that was my paraphrase of your lecture, Professor Lauster, and、uh, now perhaps allow me to.、Um, To reflect on、um, on bits and pieces of your lecture,、um, and perhaps raise two or three questions for you.、Uh, the the first is that、um, it dawned on me that in your lecture, those who engage with the topic of religious experience, be it those who.、Uh, Hold to a more critical stance of this concept or this approach to religion, or those who espouse this、uh, approach,、um, seem to tend to be reformed, or at least、um, have a preference towards reformed theology over Lutheran theology.、Um, figures like Schleiermacher, who was of course a, a reformed theologian himself, and Storch had a clear preference. 
for um, Reformed uh, theology. Um, he was good friends with uh, Evren Kuyper from uh, the Netherlands and uh, spoke highly, of course, of Kuyper, although not uncritically. And uh, on the Anglophone side, as you briefly mentioned, there's Jonathan Edwards. And among those who hold to a more critical uh, stance towards at least the Schlemacherian uh, tradition of religious experience would be Karl Barth, who is also reformed. So uh, I wonder if this is out of mere coincidence or um, if there's something deeper in the, the different trends of Protestant theology. And I also wonder why is it that the more ecclesiastical Lutheran theologians didn't uh, develop such a, a, a theology or philosophy of religious experience. So, of course, we have um, um, the mystical pietism uh, within the Lutheran tradition, but that did not seem to develop into something as robust as, say, Schleiermacher's rendition of this concept. Um, I, I think the closest uh, figure who comes to a Lutheran theologian who develops on Luther's insights uh, would be Soren Kierkegaard. Um, he would draw on, for example, Luther's notion of Anfechtung. Um, and he would draw on Luther's um, dialectical uh, 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 theologia crucis, and, uh, and and so I think he would be the figure who comes closest. And, and of course, that would represent a very different approach to religious experience than Schleiermacher, um, something much more subjectivist, sophistic, and existentialist. And I think uh, Bard uh, partly drew on him in his critique of Schleiermacher's philosophy of religion, especially in the first two editions of his commentary on Romans. But I, I just wonder why, um, why is it that L Luther himself had such a, a strong, um, dimension of religious experience in his own theology and his in his own biography. And yet um, his followers didn't seem to develop that either positively or negatively. That would be my first question. And my second question would have to do with Kant. So um, you, you began with this quote, um, from Kant's critique of practical reason uh, found at the end um, about the starry heaven and uh, the, the moral conscience uh, within me. Um, and he, he uses this very interesting term. Uh, I, I forgot what the English translation was in, in your quote, but the German original was Nachdenken. And uh, I, I personally read that theologically uh, I know most Anglophone uh, scholars would disagree with me, but I, I tend to read that in line with the, the fetus querens intellectum tradition, the speculative tradition. And of course, I, I know people like Hegel or Heine thought that um, um, Kant was a figure who, who uprooted speculative philosophy root and branch. Um, but I, I think it, it's a right way of reading Kant, um, um, reading this Nachdenken as something reflexive, um, something uh, in the speculative tradition, especially given the prominent role of his regulative principle in the first critique and um, how belief in, in God is transformed into something um, that he calls constitutive and imminent in the practical use of reason. And, and he would develop that phrase from the second critique in his third critique to talk about the sublime and the beautiful and associate that with feeling. And I think in the third critique, he comes closest to, um, to 19th century developments of uh, religious exper uh, experience 
in, for example, the Sturm und Drang movement in, in the late 18th century to Romanticism in the 19th century, uh, he, he comes very close to that. And he actually had debates with Schiller um, about the sublime. And yet, somehow, I, I, I wonder why he scratched, or he didn't really scratch, but he didn't think that the third critique was capable of answering the question of hope. So, so he, he, he wrote this uh, theological appendix at the end, which he deemed insufficient. So, so later on, he wrote um, his Religion in the der Grenzen der Blossen Benut, Religion Within the Bounds of Bare Reason. And there he seems to shit away from the kind of ex uh, religious experience that would be propounded by later proponents like Schleiermacher. And he takes religion to uh, the path of rational, moral religion. But even within this work, he mentions this notion of attitude, um, a union of attitudes with the son of God. So, my, my question, uh, long story short, is um, do you think Kant contributed more positively or um, did he set more negative limits for the development of this notion of religious experience uh, as we find in 19th century metaphysicians like Schleiermacher and Tölsch. Did he set the negative boundaries for that or, or did he actually contribute positively to it? And would he in fact agree with a lot of things that Schleiermacher says or would he not? Yeah, Professor Tseng, thank you very much for your uh, uh, question. These are excellent questions and uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to have such an expert like you uh, on these topics. So uh, that is very helpful for me. So the first question is um, was uh, on Lutheran and the Lutheran tradition. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, and it is astonishing because uh, uh, Luther had, is uh, the author of the Protestant uh, tradition with um, mm, the deepest descriptions of that what is what we would call religious experience. Uh, that has uh, a couple of reasons that uh, Lutheranism, uh, I'm, uh, it's not interesting, but just uh, to understand what I'm, I'm uh, part of the Lutheran church in Bavaria, so I'm Lutheran. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm free to criticize my own tradition. Uh, the Lutheranism, is not as a, as a world religion, Lutheranism is less important than the reformed tradition for some reasons. Lutheranism uh, was very uh, soon linked only to more or less Germany and Scandinavia. And then Lutheranism has to uh, enter a marriage with the state. And uh, Lutheranism was for, for a couple of uh, uh, hundreds of years a link very strong to the state, we can say that we can roof that German history. The reform tradition went to England, went to the Netherlands, and then, uh, and that is the most important thing, they went to the United States uh, and, and Northern America, and then they developed their uh, quite broad tradition. So for all aspects on modernity, uh, the reform tradition is a little bit more interesting because uh, the reform tradition was forced to be more open to, to all kinds of developments. And that is what your observation uh, makes so interesting is we have both. We have the invention of religious experience in Schleiermacher who was a reformed pastor, but we have also the strong, strongest critics on religious experience also from the reformed side, uh, which is uh, the, the part of Karl Barth. Uh, and both are reformed theologians. So uh, I would uh, agree completely um, that is uh, the openness uh, of the reformed tradition to uh, philosophy, to, to aspects of the, the cultural development, which made, uh, makes uh, the reformed tradition here a little bit more uh, interesting. You mentioned Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a Lutheran, a Danish Lutheran. Uh, and that is what makes me wondering, uh, 
I have not an answer. You, you, you raised the question, which I, I have to, to think about it, uh, is the Lutheran tradition has such a strong uh, tradition on uh, religious experience, on mysticism. Uh, and why uh, do we have here so, so less contribution to the, to the category of uh, religious experience? Kierkegaard would be an exception. He is uh, something uh, at his own. Your second question is uh, uh, at the same level, very interesting. Uh, you put it at the end very close. Uh, so is Kant uh, good or bad for the <laughs> conception of religious experience? And I must, uh, uh, you will be disappointed, uh, I must uh, answer uh, both. Uh, you mentioned both works, uh, his late works, uh, the, how do you say in English, uh, um, uh, religion in, in inside uh, pure uh, bounds of pure reason or? Bare reason. Uh, bare reason. Uh, uh, the uh, has uh, translation. Uh, okay. Uh, Kant uh, has written the very the, the quite old Kant with seventy has written a book only on religion. You mentioned that, and it is, uh, and his work is as you exactly as you described it. I'm, I agree completely. It's it's uh, a, a rational contribution to uh, how what what can we do with religion, and that would be uh, uh, against all concepts of religious experience because he is very cautious with uh, the the invert uh, experience. It's too subjective, but. You mentioned that even in that book, we can find some hints, uh, personal experience with Christ, uh, Christ as an, as an imagine of humanity, more, much more interesting. And that is uh, the, the, the link which we should follow is his third critique, you mentioned that. Uh, and uh, there we find so interesting descriptions of the supply, aesthetic ex, uh, descriptions. And that is where we can find uh, Kant as one of the, um, I would, I try not to, to exaggerate it, but uh, we, we could say he, he gives uh, the intellectual means uh, to understand what religious experience is and to bring in it so close to an aesthetic experience. So uh, at a certain way, I must say both. Uh, when he is dealing explicitly with religion, he is very opposite to religious experience. When he is uh, dealing with uh, inward perspectives in aesthetics, he is something like a father of the concept of religious experience. And that's the reason why Otto, uh, even James and Max Weber are, uh, have to do so much with Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the answers. And uh, let's perhaps move on to um, yeah. questions from yeah. the audience. And um, um, there's a question in German. Uh, I'll just read that in English um, for the audience. Uh, so, so the question is, I, I am asking about the notion of immediacy in Schleiermacher. Does this notion have to do with uh, intellectual intuition in the Platonic tradition? Yeah, uh, um, an excellent question. And there is a long discussion of what the... Uh, um, there is a, <laughs> a language problem we have in, in German uh, two expressions for what we I can say in English only uh, intuition uh, we yeah. can he's using the term in, intellectual uh, Anschauung yeah. uh, uh, and, and yeah. exactly we can say in German Anschauung and intuition and uh, in English uh, it's intellectual intuition and um, the point is, I would agree completely. Uh, uh, Schleiermacher was a scholar of Platon. He translated. He was the first translator of, of, of Plato. And uh, what we can find in, in Plato, uh, the, the intellectual intuition uh, is very, very similar to that what uh, um, Schleiermacher wants uh, to show with his concept. We have, for example, the, the famous seventh letter of Plato. Uh, with the famous exifeness, the, the suddenness uh, of uh, the idea of the good. Uh, that's nothing we can grasp only by dialectic. It's something which comes to us uh, in type of an intellectual anschauung. There is a, is a strong link. Uh, I would go so far to say Schleiermacher is a modern Platonist. I would agree. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, just my opinion. Um, I, I think he revives the uh, Platonist tradition after Kant, who, who of course uh, severely criticized the notion of intellectual uh, intuition. 
insisting that uh, it belongs to only to this philosophical notion of God. Only God can have that. Um, and uh, and what Schleimacher does is to say, well, this intellectual intuition is not not just rational, but it's uh, it's also got to do with our gefühl, our feelings. Um, and I think that's what makes him different from uh, Hegel, whom I also think, uh, I, I'm not sure if he would agree, uh, was a modern reviver of the Platonist tradition in some way. Mm -hmm. um, the other question is in Chinese, and I, I, I'll just translate that into English uh, for you. Um, so nowadays there's natural scientists who use uh, neurological sciences as their uh, approach me uh, research method to treat the topic of religious experience, uh, such as uh, electro, and I don't know how to read this, encephalogram, positron emission tomography, um, to try to ascertain the authentic authenticity or falsity of religious experience. Do you think that these scientific endeavors are valid? Yeah, that is a, a difficult question. <laughs> um, I guess uh, we, we, we come all the way back to the, to the main problem which we have in philosophy or humanities discussing with neurosciences, that is a so-called problem of sequalia. Uh, there are uh, um, in these uh, procedures um, you mentioned in your question. Um, for example, there are, um, uh, you can see if a person is praying, you can see, you can measure it uh, with, uh, uh, how do you call it, EE electroencephalograms. Uh, you can, there is a certain area that can a neuroscience, uh, neuroscience can prove there are certain areas for religious, especially for religious activity. But what neurosciences cannot do is what happens in that moment. They can prove there happens something. But that is the famous uh, uh, point, uh, which is uh, the strongest discussion now, as far as I, between humanities and neurosciences. Uh, take another example. You can measure pain. If I now uh, take a, a mod, have had pain in my finger, uh, a neuroscience could see, ah, okay, he, he must have some pain in his body, but he can never describe uh, how pain feels for me personally. And my pain uh, feels different to your pain. And that uh, we are here to the qualia problem, uh, but I'm, I'm not so hostile against neuroscience. I would say it would be very helpful to, 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 to discuss with them more and uh, the emotional turn uh, uh, we cannot do without neurosciences because they uh, help us uh, to describe um, Feelings, emotions are representations of our bodily states, and they help us uh, to describe uh, that. There is an, uh, he is a native Portuguese, but now teaching in the US, uh, um, uh, Damasio, Damasio. Um, he, he wrote a lot of uh, books on uh, uh, this uh, inner inward uh, uh, connections, and also the, the great American philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Uh, is very open to, to research programs of neurosciences because they help us to uh, understand how the representation in our mind works. So I would, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to more deep co um, cooperation with neurosciences. Thank you for your answer. And our next question, uh, do you think there are different extents of religious experience, say a religious experience of higher level and lower level? Yeah, uh, that is uh, also a, a difficult question. Uh, um, mentioned Hegel wrote in his philosophy of religion, which is a main work of the Western tradition, uh, he made uh, exactly that what is asked here. He made, uh, he dis, um, distinguished between high religions and low religions and said uh, the highest religion is the, that form of religion uh, which came very close to the absolute uh, and the presentation of the absolute. And then there are low religions which rites and, and for a, his typical Protestant, uh, rites are low, thinking is high. Uh, 
this uh, we cannot repeat. We cannot go back. It's, and, and by the way, it's, it's, it's completely Eurocentric. Uh, and that is not the way we can do that. But the task which we had from Hegel is, and that is the point, the good point of your question, uh, we have to develop criteria which not, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, which, which not allows us to make a hierarchy, but uh, uh, we must have an evaluative system if we want to discuss, not everything could be the same. And there I would find the work of Robert Bella, uh, which I mentioned at the end of my paper, quite good. He said that the point must be uh, how close can, can a, a religious experience come uh, to reality? So what do we learn from the world? Uh, and that should be a criteria. And that I found a, wonder, a, a wonderful idea. It's difficult to, to develop criteria, but uh, um, what can we learn from religious experience? And that should be a criteria to distinguish between higher and lower levels. That is not that we would make a ranking of world religions. To say, as we did in my tradition, Christianity is above all, and then that is not helpful. Helpful is uh, what can we learn from the variety of uh, religious perspectives? Thank you. And I, I think this question is, in fact, uh, related to the last one. So we will skip the, the one in the middle for now. And uh, uh, perhaps we can address the, the last one. Uh, is Schleim, uh, and does Schleiermacher agree that non-Christians can have religious experience? Yeah, uh, that is... Uh, uh, um, the answer would be simple. And it's a good question because he was a Christian pastor and uh, it's a delicate question, but the answer I would say is simply yes, surely. Uh, you can make religious experience wherever uh, you feel in the sense of... Uh, um, uh, William James, you feel in contact with uh, a category you, you and the person would name the divine. Uh, there we have a religious experience. So Schleiermacher is one of the first Protestant thinkers who opened the mind for religious pluralism. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And uh, I, this question, in fact, um, has also bothered me as a uh, very academic question. Um, of course, we know that in his early work on religion, he was trying to address questions raised in the Berlin Bar by figures like Friedrich Schlegel. Um, uh, so, so he wants to address this culture to despisers of religion. And there he writes that uh, religion is not, neither uh, knowing nor doing, but uh, taste of the, the uh, taste and sensibility of the infinite. And um, he draws this very neoclassicist distinction between ancient Rome and modern Rome, saying that um, modern Rome is godless but consistent, and yet ancient Rome was truly pious or truly godly, hospitable to every god. And uh, there you have a very pluralist, uh, pluralist view of religious experience. Uh, but, but as he matured and when he was writing the Christian faith, I, I don't know, I, I don't have an answer, but sometimes I sense that he is retracting this earlier religious pluralism by saying that there's no salvation outside of the church and that a religious experience is simply the feeling of the need of redemption and that all began with Jesus Christ and you need the life of the Holy Spirit as the life of the church to have this experience otherwise you you, you don't get salvation and you don't get religious experience so so I, I've always wondered has he changed his mind on this question in his later work or has he not because there are also other passages in his christian faith that seem to be more in in agreement with on religion yeah we have in in Schleimer, as in many protestant authors uh, uh, development and that's uh, the tragedy of uh, of human beings the young schleiermacher was full of courage <laughs> and the old <laughs> schleiermacher was too cautious my my uh, Teacher, my, my doctoral supervisor said always, only reads a young Schleiermacher, forget the old one. Uh, but that would be uh, 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 a too harsh. Uh, no, there is an explanation. The second uh, Christian face, the, the second book you mentioned is much closer, but we have to, to, do, to, to defend him. It is written for future pastors. 
it is written uh, in the universe for the formation of future theologians. And uh, the first book is written for the public. It's written for the intellectual public. And so there are the addresses are completely different. But there is, uh, your observation is completely right. There is uh, a certain um, gap between the early and the late Schleiermacher, which we cannot uh, overcome so easily. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I think we have time for one last question. Can we do that? Uh, the, the linguistic turn, yeah, question. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, after the baptism of the linguist turn, linguistic turn, how can we make more sense of religious experience? Yeah, uh, I would say the, the uh, to make it short, though we can probably uh, uh, answer also the, the next way. Um, the linguistic turn is very important in the 20th century, but it is, um, uh, as far as I intend, it, it is too narrow because uh, it puts only the accent on, on language. And what we can learn from religious experience that there are a lot of pre-language situations uh, in our mind. And so I would say uh, we can make a more sense of religious experience compared to the linguistic turn there is much more inside us than we can express in words. I, I guess it might be in Chinese the same as in German. I make an experience. Let me say I see something very wonderful in nature. Uh, it is hard to find the words to express it precisely. Uh, and that is what we can learn. Religious, uh, our capacity to experience the world is greater than our capacity to uh, express it with words in any language. Mm. Um. There's actually this uh, this volume edited by Hans Lenk uh, on on uh, the, the the Chinese notion of transcendence or something like that. One of the authors is uh, uh, Chen Zhongying, uh, who, who uses this onto hermeneutic approach to to discuss um, transcendence in in Chinese philosophy, and it's fascinating. And a lot of it has to do with linguistic analyses of the Chinese language. So so I I, I yeah I, I agree with you. I think. Uh, even after the linguistic turn in philosophy, we can make a lot of sense out of this notion or phenomenon of religious experience. Um, we actually received two more questions. Um, do you think we can uh, address I these? Try to make it short. Yeah, sure, try. Okay. <laughs> let's, um, let's try it. All right. Uh, one of them says, can religious experience happen without people experiencing it? For example, during the Eucharist, the pastor cannot experience it but the sanctification happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a delicate question. Uh, and as a, a Catholic would say, yes, uh, the, the, what is written in, 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 with, with, um, in Chinese and Mandarin uh, is uh, uh, the sanctification um, is an objective uh, category. Uh, and as a Protestant, I must say, a religious experience is always linked to our capacity to experience it. And I would say, uh, uh, if I do not experience it, uh, it cannot happen. So religious experience is always linked to our consciousness. That's the definition of experience. Experience means there must something happen here. Uh, otherwise, it is not an experience. But it is interesting. There, uh, uh, so I would say the objectivity um, would be, for me, a hard category. but. Uh, um, the other thing is, I and that is linked to the um, other question, I know that I cannot express all the things in words. So in that point, what here is called objectivity, I would call it a certain type of intuition. I can have an intuition that there happens something without grasping what exactly happens there. And that is uh, brings us back to religious experience. Um, I, I thought it would be interesting to mention um, on a personal note that when I was a child in Taiwan, my, uh, my parents uh, would take me on the street and there would be these um, uh, Lutheran fundamentalists. I think they were uh, mostly Finnish um, or the, their denomination was of a more Finnish background uh, who would just spray water or sprinkle water on passersby and they would say, you, you have been baptized, you are now saved. 
and there's uh, no subjectivity to it whatsoever. They don't even have faith. And you just a sprinkle of water makes them saved somehow. And, and I, I think that has to do with the Finnish uh, reception of Luther's theology. Uh, but just, just an <laughs> interesting personal note. Um, uh, last question. Did Paul Tillich talk much about religious experience? Yeah, that is... Uh, uh... Unfortunately, our time is uh, is like our whole life is limited. Uh, I uh, apologize for not having mentioned uh, Tillich uh, because he would be uh, by the by um, by the way Tillich was a teacher, the academic teacher of Robert Bella. Uh, Robert Bella, in his last book, uh, is expressing his gratitude. He learned so much from Paul Tillich. Uh, of course, Tillich, uh, he is not explicit with the expression religious experience because there is, it's too subjective from, but he is one of the, uh, he's very close to the uh, philosophy of existentialism in the 20th century. Uh, so I would say uh, Tillich uh, is, uh, would be a very interesting uh, author to study the concept, a modern concept of religious experience. And I only have to apologize to not mention him um, in, in, the, in the paper, but he's a very, he, he would be our man for discussing a religious experience. Wow. Thank you so much for this most fascinating lecture, uh, Professor Lauster. And uh, um, I, I would ask the audience to um, give a round of, of, of applause, except you can't hear them, um, but I really want to applaud. I was totally fascinated and excited. Now, um, as closing matters, um, you're welcome to follow our WeChat and website, uh, and the link have been, uh, yeah, they are being displayed on our uh, screen. So you can just scan the QR code or uh, enter these links, and you can follow us there or um, future lectures and events. Um, I hope uh, most of them will be as fascinating as today's event. But I've got to say, um, today's lecture was one of the uh, most exciting ones I, I, I've attended so far. So thank you so much, Professor Lausta. Yeah, thank you to you all. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you.